Good evening. Uh, I'm uh, Alex Nicholl. Uh, welcome to the ISS. Thanks very much for coming this evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce uh, Sir Bernard Gray to speak uh, again at the ISS. In actual fact, both Bernard and I were introduced uh, to the world of defence by being appointed uh, defence correspondent of the Financial Times uh, at different times many years ago. <coughs> and I'm sure that Bernard did not imagine uh, when he took on that job uh, that today, that more than 20 years later, he would just have stepped down from running the acquisition and support of, of all British uh, defence equipment. Bernard was, uh, was asked by a Labour Defence Secretary, John Hutton, to conduct a review of defence procurement, and he produced a trenchant report that many of us uh, will remember. And then he was appointed uh, by a Conservative Defence Secretary, Liam Fox, to put his own proposals into practice. And now, uh, having res really restored a lot of order uh, to the process, he's going to offer some straightforward observations about a complex business. Uh, today's <coughs> event is on the record, and Bernard, we look forward to what you have to say. Um, thank you uh, very much indeed, Alex. Um, and uh, just to... Uh, reinforce the point about the uh, FT. Um, uh, union closed shops, in, as a general proposition, may have disappeared from the United Kingdom, but the, uh, the closed shop of uh, Financial Times defence correspondence is in full and uh, working uh, operation, uh, just in case there's any doubt about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, senior appointments done. Um, the, um, in, uh, yeah, indeed. Um, uh, Louis Mayer, the uh, movie producer, um, once made the uh, rather sensible observation uh, that you should never make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, and um, I, I've always had that very much in mind as a, uh, a pragmatic person. So in, in trying to look both at what's happened and, and what might happen, I, I have in mind very much that uh, life has a way of intervening uh, and turning a state of affairs that you imagine is going to turn out into uh, something that it isn't. Uh, and for those of you who have uh, children... Um, uh, I uh, feel a little bit like uh, the Lorax in uh, the current situation, uh, where um, I speak for a largely mute community, uh, in his case the trees, and in, in my case I speak for the engineers, uh, scientists, uh, finance uh, and other specialists who work uh, in our uh, small world of defence, who uh, are not themselves usually terribly articulate or don't get much air time. Um, and um, I, I was sort of fantastic joke the other day um, by somebody who said, how do you tell which the extrovert engineer is in any room? To which the answer was, he's the one looking at your shoes when he's talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, it is a bit like that. We tend to get on uh, with our thing. We tend to uh, think that uh, the numbers will speak for themselves. And of course, uh, they should do, but often they don't in the world of uh, politics. And I, there is a need, I think, uh, to set out both what we're doing and what we have done, because otherwise uh, people draw their own conclusions without, um, without necessarily looking at all the data. We're now five years into the latest uh, effort acquisition reform, measured by my appointment as Chief of Defence Material by Liam Fox after the 2010 SDSR. Do you notice the way that I say that? Uh, to distance myself slightly from some of its conclusions, I arrived a useful three months after it had been published. Um, but put another way, we're seven years into the current process if we measure it from the point where Lord Hutton, uh, on a wait, uh, rainy uh, Thursday afternoon in November, asked me to look into this whole subject for him in late 2008. Uh, it's 17 years since I first worked on this issue with uh, John Dowdy and his uh, colleagues at McKinsey uh, for Sir Robert Worm Wormsley uh, and Lord Robertson in 1997-8. Uh, um, uh, whichever measure you take, it's time enough then for something to have happened. Um, but I think viewed through a slightly light, wider lens, this is not that much time at all. Because it's almost 50 years since Lord Rayner first recommended that the UK should establish the procurement executive to professionalise defence acquisition. And it's 76 years since the Ministry of Supply was formed to coordinate armed forces acquisitions as the Second World War gathered. 
and 69 years since the uh, Ministry of Supplies remit was expanded to include the acquisition of aircraft and nuclear weapons as well as naval and army equipment. All of these organisational changes have been aimed at improving the provision of military equipment, but lasting change has proved very difficult. Why is that? What is it about military acquisition which is so resistant to reform? Uh, apart from stopping to observe that intractable problems make great careers for many people, um, myself included, I have to say, um, uh, you should ask anybody who's been working on nuclear fusion about that for the last 50 years. Uh, in my view, the reason that acquisition form has proved such a hardy perennial is because many of the efforts to tackle it have sought to address the symptoms of the disease rather than the causes. In particular, most reform efforts have focused on two themes. First, the centralisation or decentralisation of responsibility. The establishment of the Ministry of Supply and the creation of the Procurement Executive were centralisation efforts, which came to encompass not only the production of all conventional nuclear weapons, but also military scientific research as well. The abolition of the Ministry of Supply and the Levine reforms, placing budgetary responsibilities with frontline commands <coughs> four years ago, are efforts in the opposite direction. Advocates of centralisation argue that scarce skills should be consolidated for maximum effect and efficiency. Decentralisers claim that local knowledge, specific circumstances and personal accountability trump any such benefits. Personally, I'm instinctively a decentraliser, though each of its models has advantages and drawbacks. But I think it's beyond serious doubt that the creative destruction of Silicon Valley, however chaotic, has produced superior results to the relentless uniformity of Gosplan. <coughs> of course, in defence acquisition, we don't have the kind of unfettered animal spirits that have driven the global IT revolution, more's the pity, but as a general <coughs> principle, it's wise, I think, to be suspicious of arguments for centralisation, particularly when attached to the notion of efficiency. The Soviet Union was many things, but I wouldn't say efficient was one of them. In any event, neither centralisation nor decentralisation offers any real insight into the causes of the problem. They are both genuine efforts to apply the best possible decision-making to the utilisation of scarce resources, but they are not of themselves core to the argument. In short, they are unlikely to make your fortune, in whichever industry you occupy, unless you happen to be in consultancy, where many fine houses have been bought as this concertina has expanded and contracted in fashion over the decades. I hadn't honestly got you boys in mind when I said that. <laughs> the second main theme is related to the first, but I think it is distinct. It focuses on the need to professionalise excuse me, professionalise <coughs> defence acquisition, often by harnessing private sector skills or techniques to the benefit of the public good, in this case providing equipment efficiently. The creation of the procurement executive and the materiel strategy of the last five years have both laid substantial emphasis on this strand of thought. As might be expected, I do have more sympathy with this approach than with the rather ser sterile centralised decentralised debate. But while they both are important issues, professional skills are not enough on their own to produce complete results. It takes more than technical competence to achieve greatness, something I'm sure Jose Mourinho is reflecting on <laughs> just at this moment. If neither of these two things are the essence of the issue, then what is? The following observations will probably sound trivial to you in this context, but it's stunning how much they have been ignored by practitioners over many decades, and in particular over the 2000s. But sophistry is seductive, and people love to believe that their world is uniquely complex. First people get seduced by complexity, then they get lost in it. To see clearly what's going on, we must rise above the trees to see the forest. As Tom Stoppard observed in his play Professional Foul, it's possible to convince a man of almost anything, provided he is sufficiently intelligent. Defence sometimes feels like that, where sophistry and sophistication sometimes obscure the simplest of truths. Put another way, my great friend Ian Evans of L.E.K., one of the most insightful strategists it's ever been my pleasure to work with, puts it this way. Great strategy is inherently simple and elegant, it seems so obvious when you see it, and it can be instinctively understood. It's finding that great strategy that's so bloody hard. <laughs>
The first, I think, of these simple, strategic and unvarnished propositions is this. People should not afford to people should not order equipment that they cannot afford to pay for. It sounds self-evident, doesn't it? I mean, how hard can it be to realise that you can only buy what you can afford? Mrs Thatcher uh, was definitely an uh, advocate of such an approach. It sounds patronising to even suggest such an idea. But it is absolutely central to the issue and is core to what went wrong during the 2000s. <coughs> and it's so often ignored or underestimated by defence contracting systems around the world. It's easy to ignore affordability because the curse of defence procurement is that we're not required to pay for equipment on the day we order it. We can imagine and hope that it will prove cheaper uh, than we think and since the main costs don't arise for several years after they are first announced, we can travel in hope for a very long time. Yet ignoring the issue of affordability destroys huge amounts of value. If we ignore future cash flows under circumstances where budgets are limited, and they are always limited in another iron law of the universe, then inevitably we run into circumstances where we have to slow programmes and renegotiate contracts when costs are higher than we anticipate. Slowing programmes obviously means that they take more time for the same amount of equipment acquired at the end, the very opposite of improved productivity. A greater proportion of available funds is therefore spent on overheads, Corporate centres, finance departments, carpets, curtains, cars, lunch, training team away days, the business of heating and keeping factories going, etc. And less is spent on developing or manufacturing the equipment required for the front line. It means less of the very valuable pool of, of limited money is available to, from defence departments to make its way forward to our armed forces. Many military colleagues still believe that it's better to get something started, even if available funding is inadequate, than, uh, than to accommodate the reality, because, they argue, at least there will be a programme in existence for which to fight. But in fact, all this entryist approach really does is to ensure that defence gets less equipment than it otherwise would for the money available. I first ran across this issue in 1997 when I worked for Lord Robertson. As part of a regular in-year savings exercise, um, the uh, Ministry of Defence Finance Department, and I will protect the guilty uh, by not naming names, though I could, um, uh, tried a laundry list of possible measures on me to test whether they might pass muster with the Defence Secretary. One that I vividly <coughs> recall asked us to defer two batches of spending on Eurofighter avionics development by three years. The cash flow for this measure over 10 years showed a £10 million reduction in each of the first two years, and then three years later two batches of increases of £10 million for a net zero cost over 10 years. Apparently cost neutral, and therefore a no-brainer. However, uh, in a little box on the right-hand side of the uh, spreadsheet uh, they had there was what was called the impact statement. Uh, what, would the, uh, what would the consequence of this be? Um, and this said that it would delay the in-service date of the aircraft by 18 months, in a fairly you know, downbeat sort of way of uh, writing this down. I want to leave aside any operational shortfall that an 18-month delay in our largest single acquisition programme might cause, or indeed any potentially adverse impact on export sales, though both of these issues are significant. I just want to look at the cost of it. Lengthening the programme out by 18 months causes huge numbers of people to be underemployed, factories to be used less efficiencies, overhead costs to be incurred, and working capital kept going. I calculated at the 10% interest rates of the time, remember those, um, that the measure would actually cost somewhere between 70 and 100 million pounds to implement. Put another way, we were proposing to delay a programme that would cost the UK about 20 billion pounds overall, um, uh, to delay that by about 18 months to defer, not cancel, just defer 0.01% of the program cost in a move that would cost five times as much as it would defer. And the MOD thought this was free. <laughs> this is far from the only time it's happened uh, and the UK MOD is far from the only Defence Department to take such decisions in ignorance of the truth. But tackling this mess apprehension has been the key job of the last five years. To be fair to people, it's not always easy to know what the right budget for a programme should be. 
And as well as calculating acquisition costs, we have to apportion support funds, training and infrastructure needs, and in a personal favourite of mine that will raise smiles from most people in Abbey Wood, a full weapons fit to go with any platform, which usually gets missed out. Um, on top of that, given government accounting methods, we also need to calculate the cash flow profile uh, for any program over the extended period. And all of this is far from easy to do. But that's why we need appropriate contingencies at various levels in programs to act as a buffer to mitigate the impact of these inherent uncertainties. But although it's hard, it doesn't excuse the need to try our best to achieve proper budgeting for programs. We have to produce the best estimates we can and live within them. I've spent a lot of time talking about this because if people took no other lesson but this, it would make a massive difference to defence systems around the world. Uh, it's the single most important thing that's happened in the Ministry of Defence in the last half dozen years. And it has been the difference between success and failure in getting the MOD programme back under control. Having exercised this self-discipline over the last few years, I was very interested to see what would happen in SDSR 15. And I say that from the point of view of somebody who was not closely involved in uh, the structuring uh, of it. Uh, we supplied some information into it, but I wasn't heavily involved in decision making. But I was interested to see whether the department would keep the faith, hold to the mantra <coughs> that it's exercised over the whole of the last parliament uh, of budgetary uh, discipline, or would the temptation to let that discipline go prove too much? After all, indiscipline allows you to believe that you can afford to buy all sorts of things that you've got no funds for. I'm sure we've all personally experienced that. I know I have. Um, but it's a bit like drug addiction, I suppose. It's only a very attractive option in the very short term. I will confess that at one stage this summer I was very worried. Early in the review, lots of ideas were, quite rightly, being tested. Many of the new and alternative ideas were genuinely interested and could have added value. But they couldn't be accommodated with either, sac without, with either, either without sacrificing existing plans or abandoning budget discipline. But the temptation was very strong. And then about two-thirds of the way through the SDSR process, something very interesting happened. The system then tested the priority of all possible changes and set them in the context of what could be afforded overall. Some efficiencies and savings could be made, and if they were, and only if they were, resources would be freed up to be spent on new priorities. But the discipline was maintained, and I had nothing to do with that, right? So it's not a personal input in that. I'm observing a system, and the system had absorbed for itself the lesson. The whole of the Ministry of Defence had taken its principle to its, the principle to its heart. Discipline had become the new orthodoxy. To me, this was a huge relief, and I think a great encouragement for us all for the future. The lesson so expensively learned in the 2000s seems to have been absorbed in the 2010s. I hope the meaning sticks for good and spreads more widely to other uh, defence departments around the world, because I think it is the very foundation of good governance. A second governing principle for me is, once you've made your mind up about what you want, stick to it. Again, this is far from rocket science, but it's amazing how often this is ignored. Sometimes it's for a good reason. There's a change in operational circumstances for often, uh, for example. But more often, it's fashion or the desire of a new team to make their mark on a program that is the real cause of this change. I'm quite fond of saying that the relationship between requirements managers and defence programmes is like the relationships between dogs and lampposts. <laughs> requirements managers simply find it impossible to pass a programme by without leaving their mark on it. However human or canine this may be, it is absolutely lethal to stability and value in programmes. Just as we need to maintain financial discipline, we need requirements discipline if we are to succeed. Change, whether for financial or requirements reasons, imports instability, cost and delay. It's the enemy of getting equipment to frontline forces. Here I would insert a subsidiary point. In my office at the MOD, I had a picture pinned up that had two boats lashed together, a small tender tied to the back of a super yacht. The small tender was called Original Order. The super yacht was called Change Request. 
Of course, <coughs> it is true that contractors the world over, and not just in the defence industry, often make their money not from a heavily competed low-margin original order, but from change requests made by clients after a contract has been awarded. Any of you that have the builders in should be strongly aware of this. Um, some changes in programmes, of course, are inevitable because not all issues can be anticipated in advance. But minimising those changes helps conserve value. Some people say that this means we should revert to fixed price contracting, but I think that's a false goal. Fixed price contracting that goes wrong gives industry every incentive to destabilise a programme and encourage change requests. We need to find a way to align interests and not set the defence departments and defence contractors in opposition to one another. Both sides need to share risk. To those in the defence industry who would prefer a risk-free contracting approach instead of risk sharing, I would say this. If we all knew in advance that the original order was going to be the product delivered, and we, therefore we weren't going to change it, we'd all think a lot more carefully about how to price that we would insist on clarity from the customer and we would seek to minimise and allocate resources and risks appropriately at the beginning. We would be much more careful about how we managed programmes if, it were, if we were all at risk together. In short, we'd run better programmes closer to original time and cost and create an industry more respected and more able to compete internationally for exports. What's good for the front line is in fact also good for industry. One of the things I've tried to instil in both mod teams and industry over the last five years is what I refer to as investment-grade decision-making. In the Type 26 programme, for example, we've spent the last 18 months characterising over 90% of the costs of the ship, whether in yard industrial facilities, overheads, labour, third-party spend. This has been done through a joint cost model, which has been worked on over the past two to three years. And we now know in detail what the costs of the program are, uh, where they fall, how, how they should be profiled, and it's much easier to construct a more sophisticated set of contractual arrangements that let risks vest in the most appropriate place if you have that information. It also makes decision-making much more rigorous. We've asked, for example, questions about where the return on investment would lie for any infrastructure work. And I have challenged BAE, who've encouraged the Ministry of Defence to spend money on something which had a 3% return on investment, whether if that would actually qualify to uh, get past their weighted average cost of capital, which must, have, I've roughly calculated, be about 11 or 12%. Which the answer is, of course, no. Uh, and then I asked them um, why they would want me to invest in something that they definitely wouldn't invest in. Um, and um, they go back and, oddly enough, come back with a better proposition the next time. Um, I think, from my point of view, having that kind of uh, information uh, and, and setting those contracts um, allowed us, for example, to deconstruct the ship, rather than simply having a fixed price contract or a cost plus contract for a ship overall, to break the ship down into different uh, subsets. So, for, a year, for example, about a year ago, we let around £900 million worth of contracts for long lead items and detailed design uh, on a maximum price basis with an incentive to drive down costs. And that approach has already saved around £150 million, pounds, uh, or around 20, 15 to 20% on that batch of work. More broken down contracts of that nature, I anticipate, will follow uh, for the Type 26 programme in due course. Discipline and clarity of information and thought helps everybody succeed in programmes then. In that context, I want to make one other point about industry which has been slightly voguish recently. Um, there's been considerable debate about industrial policy and the benefits or otherwise of sourcing from the UK versus, versus buying off the shelf. Um, and my answer to this question, as to all other questions, uh, will be, it depends. Um, the UK, like any other country, has limited resources to put against any set of tasks, and we have to decide where it's best to focus our limited resources. In deciding where to focus these efforts, the guiding principle for us surely should be where can we best add value, either from a defence output or national prosperity perspective. In a world of scarce resources, we should make sure that we fund those areas where we have competitive advantage well. 
where we have less competitive advantage, we should use the intellectual property developed by our allies and by their equipment, notably in areas where we need small volumes of specialist equipment that would never justify the cost of developing them alone within the UK. So to me, it makes eminent good sense to buy C-17s or rivet joint or P-8 aircraft from the US when we need a handful of each of those different types of equipment. It's simply not worth the billion pound plus price tag to develop such systems nationally for a slack handful of platforms. And however autarkic it likes to pretend it is, France makes very similar rational decisions about systems such as the E-2 Hawkeye radar for its aircraft carrier. The billions saved through such <laughs> rational decision making are then available for use in the development of areas where the UK can genuinely compete to the advantage of the nation and our allies. I think in many cases such cross-procurement decisions where we develop and produce some equipments that are bought by our allies and our allies develop and uh, procure some systems that we then buy from them uh, as imports is a much more effective and efficient international collaborative uh, mechanism than unwieldy joint development activities and I would like to see much more of that happen uh, in a NATO context. Of course I understand that any contractor disadvantaged by a particular decision in this vein won't like it but there is a clear triage here for us that makes sense. Should we pick national development, cross procurement or joint development? The choice depends upon the economics of competitive advantage. Adam Smith had much to say on this subject, and I understand he is a very fine economist. <laughs> Even if he, and uh, no friend of the um, uh, uh, defence monopolies, I suspect. In emphasising discipline, open, work, uh, open book working, appropriate risk distribution and clarity of mind, in what to build where, I've set slightly to one side the issue of skills. It's not because I don't think they're relevant, they are absolutely critical but more because unless we have leadership that creates the circumstances that allow skilled people to succeed, we will be wasting our time. Skills frustrated by a dysfunctional system can achieve little. Skills in the right structure are a powerful force. So I'm pleased over the past few years we have created circumstances in the Ministry of Defence that will allow skills to be effective. And we're now beginning to grow those skills in mod and industry to make the most of the opportunity that we have at hand. Within DNS, our transformation activity stresses three elements. A new people model, which essentially takes us to more market-based uh, terms and conditions for staff. A balanced functional matrix where we operate uh, line management and project teams, but we also have strong functions for career development. And the implementation of strong project control frameworks. Each of these are aimed at getting skills to work inside the organisation. I think there's now a much greater understanding within the defence community about the need for good project management and effective project controls in all major tasks. But what has yet to happen in many cases is for those tools to be systematically applied, and I include industry within this um, as well as Ministry of Defence. But beyond the implementation of those tools, it takes years of practice for those skills to be embedded deeply so that everyone across a network can instinctively embrace them. And to understand the implications of data flowing from project control metrics, we are at best in the foothills of this journey. Uh, there have been, uh, over the last 12 months, uh, various different commentaries in newspapers about what it takes to become an expert at something. Uh, and the rough rule of thumb is, have you spent 10,000 hours practicing something? Um, uh, by that measure, at least, I am now an expert in defence procurement, having spent five years at so roughly 60 hours a week working on this subject. Um, um, uh, but uh, I don't think that most people in most projects have spent 10,000 hours working on project controls. And until they are, they won't have automated it within their uh, uh, brains so that they can actually take in that data in a fairly... Uh, subconscious way uh, and use their higher functions for thinking we're still driving using our front brain uh, in this rather than it being an automatic response so importing embedding and making these tools second nature is a vital plank for the next phase of acquisition reform used properly in a genuine partnership of equals between government and industry they are the golden thread that makes programs successful for us all Discipline, clarity, a genuine par partnership, project controls and skilled people on all sides will deliver good outcomes in defence acquisition. Of that I've got no doubt. 
We now need to see through these changes and stay the course. One of the other besetting sins of government is to be too voguish in seeking solutions to problems and too quick to demand results. My strong plea as I leave is that people should not dig up the plant every five minutes in order to see how it's growing. This honestly will not help. Much has been achieved in the past five years that should give policymakers confidence that the course is worth continuing. In acquisition, we've taken a programme which was generating cost overruns in the billions each year in the late 2000s to one where the predicted outturn cost in each of the last two <coughs> years has fallen. As I understand it, the National Audit Office is now considering abandoning the major projects report in its current form because it believes the programme has been brought back under control. That's my generous way of saying that there isn't anything controversial in it. Instead, I think it intends to focus on the affordability of the 10-year defence programme, something that we stressed in the 2009 report, and the first point I made in this lecture. So an out-of-control new equipment programme has been brought back to stability in the last five years. That is a huge step forward. In support, focused effort to drive down costs has already saved around $4 billion in renegotiated contracts over the next decade, with more to come. In logistics, we've cut purchases from $2 billion to $1 billion a year, in line with our annual consumption. From a point where stocks were rising at a billion a year for the decade from 2000 to 2010, a rise from £30 billion worth of stock to £40 billion worth of stock, and where the policy choices that we were confronted with in 2011 were literally, should we buy more warehouses, <coughs> build and buy more warehouses to put it all in, <coughs> or should we sell off some of the stock at 10 cents on the dollar? The notion of turning off the tap to avoid the flood seemed not to have occurred to anybody. Turning off the tap has saved £3 billion for the taxpayer so far in stocks that we don't need accumulating in warehouses we don't have. Those savings in avoiding unnecessary purchases will carry through into the future and it means that the UK will have to borrow £1 billion less every year in perpetuity because of the actions that we've taken to control purchasing. These successes in stabilising acquisition, cutting the cost of support and putting spares on a rational footing are concrete, valuable results of the work that has saved the country billions. And I hope they give the government confidence to see this programme through. We've carried this pro problem for over 50 years, as I said at the beginning, and it must be worth the investment of a decade by us all in a solution that's already borne so much fruit. So what would I do next to improve the situation further? Well, as I say, embedding skills and discipline so that it becomes second nature is the first and most critical element. In that vein, there are encouraging signs, as the discipline in the recent Defence Review shows. But it does take years of practice to become an expert, and I urge us to put in that piano practice. In this context, I think it's a helpful thing that I hand over to Tony Douglas at this time. It's not a good thing if any one initiative becomes too identified with a single individual. The process of reform has to be owned by the institution, even if it is driven by individuals within it. To have a programme endorsed and carried through by many people is critical to making sure it endures. So what would I say to those people who have travelled the road this far and those who now pick up the burden? First, to all of my team, in the mod and in industry, I would say thank you. Everyone has put in a huge amount of work to change our business over the last five years. And while we've not always agreed, we have synthesised a new way of working that's made both government and industry much more effective. I thank you all for that effort, most particularly my immediate team in DENS. Please see this task through. As well as embedding skills and tools, the place I would look next for inspiration and value is in the support of equipment. In many ways, the UK, in many ways, the UK has led the world and with joint industry and government working in support, most notably in aircraft availability contracting. But there is a great deal more that can be done. Most of the effort of the past decade has been focused on new equipment acquisition reform, and rightly so, because this is the area where things can go most badly wrong at the cost of billions. But we spend as much on the support of existing <coughs> equipment as we do on new acquisition, and here our data is poor, our ways of working less well characterised. 
There is money in this hill, it is worth pursuing, and it will come to book much earlier than the savings that come out of new equipment acquisition. I'm indebted to my friend uh, John Dowdy and his colleagues at, at uh, McKinsey for some of that observation. Um, my final observation is this. Please do not turn everything into a rigid process or a set formula. <coughs> Applying discipline and learning tools and techniques are important. But playing the piano is about more than practicing scales. We learn scales to allow us to use the instrument unconsciously, to free our minds for more useful and demanding tasks in interpreting what we should do next. Our best successes in the last few years, the renegotiated aircraft carrier contract, the scout vehicle pur purchase, the Marshall air traffic system, and a dozen or so support contract changes, have all come from us thinking through how best to shape the tools at our disposal in the particular circumstances that we face with that contract, not by a applying a rigid one-size-fits-all approach. We laugh at the Catherine Tate computer says no joke, both because it's obviously wrong and because we encounter it all too often in our lives. We laugh at the world we have created for ourselves. Let's try to avoid that within defence. Let's use our skills and creativity to th think through the challenges we face and use the tools at hand to fashion the best answers to the particular problems in front of us. We will make mistakes, but that's in the nature of trying to improve. I have no problem with people who make mistakes. Everybody <coughs> makes mistakes every day. The key thing is whether we learn and whether we do things better on average over time. Too often, I think, in the UK, we are insufficiently tolerant of people who try to do things, whether they work or not. We demand instant success on all occasions, and unsurprisingly, people are not very adventurous. In other markets where people are more prepared to take a risk, they do better. It's in the nature of entrepreneurial activity that you have to take risk in order to make progress. We will serve our nation and our armed forces well if we use the best and most creative parts of ourselves to fashion a future from the tools at hand. We should aim for the stars and be ambitious in what we do. And in that ambition, we will find greatness. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we, we've heard that the uh, the grey uh, two the two grey rules of uh, of defence uh, procurement are, are simple rules and uh, and I think you've indicated that so often they haven't been stuck to but I think you've also indicated that it is a complex business with many different factors and many different <coughs> difficult uh, choices to be made. I'm going to open it up straight away to uh, questions. Who'd like to uh, to intervene? Yeah. That, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, what are the percentages Could you identify who you are, please? I'm Anthony, the House member of ISWIS. Yep. How many, what's the proportion of private companies that get the tenders for the defense contracts? I don't really understand the question. Okay, you, you've got British airspace. I don't want to oversimplify things, but the number of corporations and companies <coughs> and private companies that tender. And some are no bid, no bid tenders. Do you know what the percentage is? I, I'm not quite sure. Let me have a go at it, and I'm, I'm, let's see if I can. Um, so we have a you know a significant Pareto effect inside of uh, defence acquisition. We spend about four and a half billion with BAE Systems, which is our largest contractor. Millions of Raytheon or BAE's British Airspace, and uh, but I mean companies that have been privatised, private companies that subcontract the Ministry of Defence. Are you asking how many are there? I'm asking the percentage. I, I don't understand what the denominator is. You've been companies that have been private, private that have been privatised over the years. <coughs> or private so companies that provide services. Yeah. To be I'm not sure we're going to get a, a good right. answer to the question, but let's so let's uh, move on. <coughs> Who else? Yeah, Julia. Um, uh, Joanne Rosco from Avacent. Um You spoke about the shared responsibility that we should aim for between um, industry and um, and the customer, in this case, the MOD. Um, do you have any thoughts on the particular contractual vehicle or structure that would then allow us to implement that kind of shared responsibility? Um, yes. I mean, it will vary from um, project to project. But if I think about um, uh, submarine acquisition, which is a, a subject close to my heart um, and brain at the moment, um, 
we tried uh, fixed price contracting uh, in the astute program in uh, 1996 and it um, almost broke BAE Systems as a company. Um, uh, they were uh, forced to uh, write off about £400 million on the stock market in 2003 and um, to this day they haven't reported a, program, a profit on the astute program uh, through their books. Uh, the, uh, the size of that program, which was you know, then about £3 billion but had a lot of inherent risk, meant that um, they were not really in a position to take all of that risk onto their balance sheet. And so in trying to give them uh, that contract uh, and incentivize performance from them, actually all what we got them to do was focus on how not to die and how to, how to get us to take this contract away rather than how to perform. It was too aggressive. Um, on the other hand, I think the situation we've had them in for the last uh, decade uh, it's also not right, where essentially we have had uh, the submarine's business on uh, sort of life support, where we've paid time and materials. And if there are any lawyers in the room, you're one of the few groups left uh, in society that get paid on the basis of uh, just the number of hours worked uh, rather than some output. Um, and um, <coughs> there's, a, there's a fantastic Victorian joke about um, uh, uh, somebody sending uh, an itemized, uh, uh, getting, receiving an itemized bill from a lawyer. Uh, and one line item said, on crossing the strand, seeing the client on the other side of the street, two shillings and sixpence. On recrossing the strand, realising that it was not, in fact, the client, two shillings and sixpence. Um, and we've been slightly in that world in, um, uh, in submarine acquisition for the last decade, uh, where we've effectively paid whatever bills BAE has sent. And that hasn't encouraged them to restructure and reform in the way it needs to. So neither end of the curve works for that. Um, I'd look to do two things in, uh, in, in that case. It's probably the most difficult case it's worth looking at. The first thing is to break the subject down into smaller contracts which are capable of being uh, discharged in a shorter period of time. What blocks of work can we uh, complete uh, that are easier to characterise rather than saying, build me four submarines, come back when you've finished. Um, you know, uh, how do we break out the power plant contract? How do we break down the uh, tactical mission systems and so forth? And the second is for each of those areas to figure out, uh, are they essentially uh, known value items? You know, we're, if we're reusing a combat system from um, Astute or from uh, surface ships, is that a pretty well characterized thing which is amenable to being fixed price contract? Or is it, in the case of uh, PWR3, a wholly new item where it's an unreasonable thing to, um, uh, to make it fixed price and it may have to be cost plus for the first one or two? So break it down into smaller units and then find some kind of uh, risk or cost share. We've got performance out of the aircraft carrier project by um, moving from a situation where it was fundamentally cost plus and uh, industry had no incentive to finish the job uh, to one where it's 50-50. So uh, for every pound increase in cost, uh, industry pays 50 pence. And for every pound reduction, they get to keep 50p of the reduction. And that has focused minds tremendously over the last two years. Um, the second ship is significantly ahead of plan and the first ship is on plan because they've got their money at stake but in a reasonably calibrated way. So I think finding you know, where that risk balance lies for a specific set of uh, technologies is the right, right sort of approach. Thank you. In the back row, Desmond Bowen. Desmond. Thanks very much for your presentation and the simplicity of your pose you a question or something you didn't say but has been said to me by uh, senior generals, four-star generals, and I've heard this uh, phrase on this occasion, which is about um, <coughs> we want to make sure that the CDM is our shopper and just our shopper. I'm not quite sure that sounds very simple, but I just wonder whether you could kind of you know, comment on what your understanding might be of that, and whether actually it's an appropriate comment from a fourth star general, someone in the middle of the centre of the Ministry of Defence, or whether it's actually it's a misappreciation, or indeed an admiral. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> I could certainly imagine that. Um, I didn't realise that there was a, a conspiracy of policy directors in the room as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, as long as you don't sit together in a group, we're all right. Um, oh, you are. <laughs> Tom. The, um, I think it is, a, um, it is a misapprehension, obviously, because um, 
in principle, uh, the armed forces should uh, have the equipment that they want. I think that's a, that you know that's a sort of unarguable first proposition. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as that because um, uh, people don't necessarily always realise, particularly if they're from the um, combat arm, um, what the choices available to them might be. Nor do they necessarily always understand what the costs of pursuing the first idea that they thought about uh, might be. And I'll give you a specific example from uh, the communications area where um, <coughs> it, it's classified, so I won't go too far into it, but the, the point was that uh, we wanted to acquire a new IT system about five years ago which, where we were under significant time pressure to do it because the current system was going to become obsolete. And um, we decided to do it in a particularly novel technical way because it was bogish. We wanted to do internet distribution of this thing. And um, uh, the combination of IT plus uh, severe time constraint and novelty are never going to go well. Um, so uh, I went, uh, and this indeed, um, uh, this project was going very badly in its first two years. And I went back to, um, in this case, Steve Hillier, uh, so not a general, um, and I said, uh, Steve, I know you've said in your requirement set you want this and you want it delivered in this voguish way, but does the voguish way really matter to you? Because if you wanted it delivered in this uh, traditional way, I can solve this problem for about 10% of the cost and 0% of the risk. Right? So... I know you said what you wanted, but did you really mean it? And the interesting thing had been that, you know, all the project teams and the requirements managers on both sides were, yes, yes, we absolutely must have what, you know, I'm, I'm just the personal shopper down at Harrods for the general. Yes, we absolutely must have it. And in a simple conversation, Steve said, no, I don't really care about that. Um, you know, and so I think it is our job to present up to people what the options are. Uh, because we probably have a better technical understanding of what can be achieved, what the risks are. I sit around the table, and um, I'll give you a different example. Um, when I first arrived at uh, Abbey Wood, uh, the person doing the then £130 billion worth of 10-year forward planning uh, was a submarine captain, or financial planning for us. And I said to people would you let me fight a submarine? Because <laughs> I quite fancy that, actually. You know, I've got a baseball cap, I could turn it around the, the wrong way, I've got a stopwatch, no idea what it's for, okay? But <laughs> I do have one. And, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I quite fancy it. How hard can it be, after all? Uh, and they said, well, of course not. They wouldn't let you do that, you know? And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, you're not trained for it. You know, we spend decades and millions of pounds training people to be submarine captains, and, you know, you can't just turn up and do it. So I said, well, why the hell have you got a submarine captain doing a professional job, planning £130 billion pounds worth of spending? Uh, finance is a professional job. The reason that people take 20 years to become finance directors is that it takes a long time to become an expert. And I think what we have to do on both sides is, uh, is respect one another's skills. And that's absolutely crucial. There are skills that we have in DNS, in program and project management, in risk evaluation, in letting contracts, in uh, technological development, which need to be understood and respected. And uh, simply being sent down to Harrods for another box of uh, uh, iced cherries um, uh, simply isn't quite the right way forward. So um, that's not a bull point, I think, for the general uh, that he makes such an observation. Okay, Bernard, I'm going to take questions in groups of two. Uh, so first of all, uh, Ben Barry, and then the gentleman in the, in the front row here. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. I'm from the Institute. Um, forgive me for being late, but I don't think in your talk you mentioned operations. Um, I, I suggest that there's a tremendous success, which is continuing to deliver normal urgent operational requirement equipment for Afghanistan, and maybe for the group Syria, I don't know. Mm. And also the, the withdrawal of the kit from Afghanistan in good order without major criticism from the NAO. Yeah. But I think if you'd been talking, say, four or five years ago, people here from the armed forces would have said, what we need to do is, is breathe the vigor and vim from the urgent operational requirement process into the mainstream. Have you got anything to say about that? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, uh, hang on just a second. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Hugo Rosemont from the War Studies Department of King's. Uh, thanks mm -hmm. for your talk. Um, it's a question about industrial policy and the development of that. Mm -hmm. Um, particularly interdepartmental coordination, much was made 
in 2012 of an industrial policy for defence and security, and we're seeing growing security expenditure in the in the latest SPSR. Yet the latest SPSR also specifically says it's going to de develop defence industrial policy, not n not wider security. Um, just interested in your thoughts as to the prospects for an integrated okay. industrial policy. I'll try and be a bit briefer. Um, uh, I agree that the UOR pro acquisition process was uh, a success, uh, both in its own terms, in getting you know three and a half thousand ground vehicles uh, out to Afghanistan uh, and lots of other equipment besides. Um, uh, uh, quickly, it has given the army a coherence problem after the event, which they're now struggling with about how they integrate those fleets uh, back into a, uh, a longer term force, and that's the the disadvantage. As you say, the time imperative for people uh, is really valuable. And um, yeah, the reason that I didn't mention uh, that aspect was I'm trying to look at the future where you know, we're unlikely to face uh, the ability to, um, uh, to get a lot of URs through um, unless the Syria situation develops very dramatically. Uh, and therefore, I don't think it's likely to directly play a big part in what we do next. But I think that the time discipline... Uh, and cutting through uh, some of the red tape is definitely a good thing to do. Some of our biggest successes have focused on trying to do that. And that's why I say, think about the problem, think about how to solve that particular problem. Usually I found, actually, the centre of the department quite responsive. <coughs> if we go along with something which isn't completely compliant with all of the process, we come along and say, here's how we can solve this problem much more quickly by cutting to the chase on X. Generally speaking, the department's responded pretty well to that. So I agree with you about the time imperative. Uh, I'm also gratified um, that um, you mentioned uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan since uh, we got that signed off within six months of all of the equipment coming out when it's, uh, I think the Iraq account is still not closed. Um, and uh, that was a, a great success for everybody in the logistics point, I agree. Um, as far as industrial policy is concerned, um, Whilst words in defence reviews are often heavily sweated over, I wouldn't necessarily read too much into uh, something saying it was going to be a defence uh, uh, industrial policy. And that, that's as likely to have been a slip of the pen as anything else. I, I'm, I don't specifically know, but I could imagine. Um, and um, uh, here I'll confess myself a bit of a heretic in the matter of... Um, uh, industrial policy, generally speaking, or indeed policy in general, um, that he said, looking at the policy directors, um, uh, you know, I, I tend to be much more guided by the uh, pragmatic realities on the ground rather than the theoretical. Um, so, you know, one of the thrusts that industry does not like about the 2012 Let Win White Paper um, is the very point I made about um, uh, let's uh, effectively. Um, uh, buy off the shelf where we don't have competitive advantage and develop where we do. I think actually Oliver's completely right about that. Lots of people who've got Me Too products in the UK defence industry obviously don't like that. Um, but, you know, for the furtherance of uh, the UK as a competitive manufacturing nation, we need to apply money where uh, we can actually succeed as opposed to in sort of, you know, um, slightly second tier uh, knockoff of things. Um, I think it will be an interesting question, though, if, if we look at, you know, to take the sort of uh, security uh, banner more generally, there will be a very interesting development over the next few years about how we go about acquiring, developing cyber capability. I think that is quite difficult. I don't have a good answer to it. You can see, uh, you know, you, it's, it's a service provision, which is always much more difficult to characterise. You've got to develop a whole bunch of skills not quite sure what the marketplace is for it. You've seen BAE acquire one or two companies in that area, for example. Um, but ha I think um, a role for policy would be for the UK to decide that it wants to make a substantial effort in that direction. But to turn policy into reality, we have to put a significant amount of money against something. And um, you know, there is money in the uh, Defence Review and in Innovation Fund for that kind of area. I just think that it's... Uh, a bigger job than we probably currently think it is to succeed in that, and we don't and we don't have the feedstock particularly of um, uh, high skilled IT graduates coming out in order to be able to um, uh, to do as much as we need to in that area. So I think in, in traditional areas are probably pretty good, but that's a that's a worry. 
Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, Bastian Giegerich and Derek Marshall. Thank you very much, um, Bastian Giegerich here with the Institute. Uh, many of the things you, you spoke about require, obviously, working together with partners. And I was just wondering whether, uh, you know, the progress that, that you've described here translates into a more harmonized approach to this within NATO uh, with other partners, or, or whether that's a hopeless, uh, hopeless <laughs> enterprise. <laughs> Derek. Well, uh, it's funny enough, my question is <coughs> very closely allied to uh, what Bastian has said, because uh, a couple of times in your uh, interesting remarks, you, you said, wouldn't it be nice if other defence departments uh, picked up some of the reforms we're doing? And I, I wonder whether that, the implication there was that we were ahead of the pack and, uh, were in fact, a sort of world leader in, in this field. Um. To take the NATO harmonization question um, uh, first, um, one of the job titles that I had, which I liked most, was being the National Armaments Director. Um, uh, but it was actually, in truth, one of the least satisfying actual jobs um, because uh, it involved going and representing the UK at NATO uh, 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 in these issues. And, uh, and I'm conscious that Desmond um, uh, sat in the back, and indeed Lord Robertson, who some of us are seeing later on, um, uh, have much more expertise in, in this area than me. Um, but I, I am reminded of the remark in the safety brief on aircraft about first secure your own mask before attempting to help others. Uh, and um, without being uh, selfish about it, you know, the UK, I think, has been relatively successful, to pick up on uh, Desmond's point. Uh, to, uh, yeah, Derek's point, I'm sorry. Um, uh, that uh, we have been successful, you know, partly um, uh, uh, because needs must. You know, uh, we've been in a very difficult place, and we've, it's forced us to think about these issues in a way that, for example, the United States hasn't really had to. And where some countries, perhaps France, for example, doesn't have as much liberty to change its structures as, as we do. Um, and so I think we have made improvements that others have yet to uh, tackle. Um, but uh, if I took an example, I'm trying to remember the exact numbers, but there's um, an E-scan radar uh, in development for uh, the Eurofighter Typhoon, which has something like 2,100 key user requirements in it. Okay. 700 of those are specified by Spain, which does not intend to acquire the radar. <laughs> And, um, uh, you know, it's a little vignette of how we, um, you know, so that's definitely a plea for the UOR approach to life. It says if you, if you are allowed 15 years to get a decent run-up at it, you can uh, overcomplicate anything. Um, and, um, you know, the difficulty is that the, the structure of the Eurofighter consortium doesn't really allow us to say to the Spanish in this case, well, look, are you entirely sure that you really need to specify 700 uh, requirements for a product you don't want? or at least can't afford. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, but, you know, we, we're, not able to, um, um, we're not able to say no because of the sort of unanimity of decision-making, which obviously also applies in, um, in Brussels. Um, and so uh, I'm not fantastically hopeful around the sort of traditional approach of a pan-European or pan-NATO defence mm -hmm. approach. Um, I've been trying much more with uh, particularly Laurent Collibillon in France to uh, develop a pragmatic approach in, in things like weapons where um, the French through MBDA have developed a set of weapons for their uh, requirements and the British through MBDA have developed a set of requ uh, weapons for our requirements um, uh, but we don't buy each other's weapons. Uh, this is great for MBDA who have a wide range of weapons to offer to third parties. Um, <laughs> but it's not so good for us because, you know, we, uh, we haven't had the benefit of each other's non-recurring expenditure. And if it were up to me, I would be encouraging my friend uh, Collibion to buy Brimstone, for example. Uh, and I would be buying the uh, new uh, MDCN ship launch cruise missile, which goes out of the launchers that we already have on our Type 45 destroyers, for example. Uh, and under those circumstances, you know, they've already developed it. It's a low-risk acquisition for us. We've already developed Brimstone. It's a low-risk purchase for them. Uh, and we can share the cost of non-recurring that way rather than attempt to assemble another version of Eurofighter. And I think that's a, 
uh, a more pragmatic trading space way forward than uh, than sort of grand projet on a multilateral basis. I think. But if I could ask you uh, the final question, uh, apart from mentioning the politicians that appointed you, you've tactfully avoided mentioning politics and politicians in and the role of those uh, in defence procurement. And I wonder if you would like to just reflect uh, on that now. In other words. Does politics get in the way of good decision making uh, in defence procurement, uh, or is it just something that you have to factor in, or uh, is it a good thing? What, 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 after your experience, what do you think? Um, uh, I have, and you know, it certainly was a commonplace observation from people that you know, um, uh, it's all the fault of the politicians would be a typical. Uh, you know, we'd all be uh, fine if it wasn't for the politicians messing it up, type of thing. Uh, it was a commonplace observation five years ago, and I, I don't think it's f completely fair. Um, uh, it was true that some defence contractors, no names, no pack drill, um, would find their way into various uh, elevated areas of government in the past uh, and say that the Ministry of Defence, in some way, shape, or form, was being horrid to them, and it wasn't in the national interest for the Ministry of Defence to be horrid to them. And on the whole, could the Ministry of Defence be told to shut up <laughs> and get with the programme? Um, and that did happen. Uh, and I think um, uh, that was to uh, the disadvantage of um, uh, a good, sound contracting relationship. Uh, but I, I have to confess that hasn't happened at all in the last five years. Um, because I think one of the things that everybody, you know, it's nothing quite like a good crisis for... Uh, causing people to face some truth, um, that um, it destabilised, you know, people, teams in DNS in particular, who were trying to negotiate hard with industry, knowing that, you know, if, if industry got an answer they didn't like, they could get it reversed higher up the chain, you know, were fundamentally disempowered by that process. And, you know, after a while you stop trying, don't you, if there's no point. Um, and uh, so I think we did get to a bad place with that. But equally well, you know, if, if I took it so 20 years ago, um, I think DNS was over, or, um, uh, Mod PE was over powerful. So when we forced some of those contracts in 1996 onto defence contractors on the original Nimrod contract and the Astute contract, we had too much power. We could say to VAE at the time, take it or leave it. And unfortunately, they took it. Um, and uh, that wasn't good. Equally well, situation 10 years later where um, you know, Mike Turner was able to go around and beat up the Defence Secretary and uh, shove the needle too far in favour of um, BAE in that case was also not right. I think we've, we've struck a, mm. a decent balance now where uh, uh, they have their skill set, we have our skill set, we are trying to work to a joint objective. They have known, and I'm sure it will be true with Tony as well, that we're commercially aware. So that you know, um, offering us uh, some beads for our mineral rights is unlikely to go very far. <laughs> um, ha however shiny the beads are, and um, uh, so I, don't, I think uh, they've been persuaded that that doesn't work. And I think, to the credit of the politicians, over the last five years, we had a few conversations early on that said we all need to stand together in this thing, and only one person should talk to them. Uh, and absolutely, people have stuck to. I mean, you know, they do have meetings, obviously. But um, you know, when anybody uh, has stepped in and attempted to negotiate something, people say, "Well, you know, X person's doing the negotiation. Go back and speak to them." And I think that's been a great strength of the last five years. As, by the way, has been the stability of uh, the ministerial teams. I think keeping people in post for a long time is uh, is a very good thing to do. Bernard, thank you very much indeed. I think we've all benefited from uh, the tremendous experience that you've had uh, over the past five years and, the, and learning how, you, uh, how you've, you've done it, as it were. So thank you very much indeed. Um, I believe, uh, I hope, that there are some uh, refreshments uh, awaiting uh, everybody. Uh, so please do uh, stay for that. But meanwhile, let's thank Sir Bernard Gray for his really interesting uh,